so I'm gonna I'm gonna start, and then Claire's gonna come on at at, at, at seven minutes exactly, and we'll keep our keep ourselves to time. Um, so the um, the gloves are gonna come off, and we're gonna we're gonna be tough on the causes of data. Um, following on from the first the first half of the session, and um, really what ADAPT is is the archaeological data archiving protocol, and this is um, our our procedures and um, tools for our team to. Um, that we've developed to um, integrate data management into the life cycle of our projects. And um, I think it's really key to point out that this is about data management because what you saw this morning was really about data archiving. And it's that distinction that I really think is critical when dealing with a lot of the, 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 the data creators is that they think they're doing data archiving when they really aren't. It's all sorts of different stuff, really. But um, they don't need to know that in some ways either. <laughs> so. Um, the um, best place for me to start is um, Silver Hill, and um, it provides a beautiful visual example of, um, of what, hap what we do with our data. We get it out of order. And um, this is from Silver Hill, where they built the flat pack shed um, at the bottom of the hill and then hoiked it up to the top, which um, I can't remember why. And I'm, maybe someone can come find me later and explain to me the valid reason for doing that. But the point is, is that this is what we're doing with our digital data. We create loads of it, and then we, we make it far too difficult by the time we get to the end. And in fact, that's what we did with Silbury Hill data set as well. And we had to spend a great deal of money to get it prepared for archiving with the ADS. So not actually into the archive, ready to go into the archive. And that's really what we're trying to, to address with ADAPT. So the way we ran the project was to um, review our internal procedures and practices as well as, um, as, well as what was going on around the rest of the sector. and. Um, and then we consulted with the rest of the sector as well as with, um, with anyone we could really find. And we looked at the tools that were available and what we needed, what we thought we needed, what was you know, and what other people were using. And then we took all that together, all that, that knowledge, and we piloted it on several projects, which led to the implementation. So I'm going to go over that. Um, in a bit more detail. So we looked at our data holdings. We currently have one terabyte of data, roughly spit over um, 134 active projects. That's our internal projects. And then um, we um, consulted with our internal teams to see what they were doing. And um, we wanted to um, understand, we wanted them to understand why what we were doing was important. So consulting with them was key to that, really. Um, but we also wanted to understand um, their data and how better we could archive it. And um, we also wanted to see what was working already, what practice we already had that was, that was useful. And then um, also what good practice they knew about. So we could, we could see if we, how we could integrate that, particularly when you're dealing with subject-specific areas and subjects, you know, very specific scientific data. They may have good practice that we're just not aware of it. So we wanted to pull that out. And we also did an um, external consultation, which was um, we met with, I met with Emily Nemo up in um, Historic Environment Scotland, but we also consult, conducted a small survey monkey with um, a few people. And again, looking for best practice and tools. And um, so let's get to the next slide. Um, and uh, these are the conclusions we came to internally, which is um, you can't do it alone, and you really can't do it at the end. Um, and um, we, we, we had a, um, a, a folder structure that existed since roughly around 2001. But what we realized was that it really wasn't um, all that, you know, although people hadn't come to us and said, it's not really working for me, the way they were using it in the ad hoc fashion that they were using it was, was, it was becoming clear that it wasn't sufficiently intuitive and um, meeting their needs. And so, we wanted to look at that again, and um, we also found, as I say, that we can't find they can't find the data, and then um, we also identified that our data is not secure, which means, and by that, what I mean is that we're, I'm routinely tasked with finding a project, or if I'm lucky, just a file that has errantly flown off to a different part of our data structure. Um, it's one of the joys of working with Microsoft. And um, we generally need to be a bit more tidier with our data sets and our, with our projects. People just don't seem to quite know where to put things. And so it's a, it's a, it's a cleanup exercise that we needed to deal with. And then um, we needed more tools, more automation and reproducible tools, things that people could create once and reuse over and over again. And ultimately, it led us to the conclusion that our, archives are not, our data is not ready to be archived. And um, externally, we. Um, we conducted a very small survey, but actually eight archivists amongst the commercial units within England is probably 
almost inc pretty inclusive. Um, so, and we also, and as I mentioned, we met with Historic Environment Scotland, and uh, what we identified was that most of the work's being done by archivists at the end of projects, and that they have a limited number of tools that they're using. There's a lack of awareness around digital archiving, and it's generally a low priority. And we felt that it was a low priority because it wasn't always being identified in project briefs and there wasn't a consistency amongst deposition requirements. So um, we also identified some good practice, so the use of batch file naming tools, which is really critical for preparing files for archiving, so they have sensible names that can make them identifiable to others. Um, there's some metadata being captured, but it's largely being done at the end of projects. And uh, they're using validation tools, so that's identifying those duplicate files, genuinely duplicate files, not things that look the same. Um, and in one instance, they were using content management system to organize their data, as well as um, data management plans. But I won't go into that, because Claire's going to discuss that in, in more detail, what those are. And um, we, yeah, we met with, we've, we also found some other good practice. Many of you will be aware of many of this. Um, at the Historic Environment Scotland, what they're doing up there seemed excellent. And um, we also looked at the ADS guidance to see where we had gaps as far as what they, what they ex expected of the archives that were deposited with them versus what we had to actually generate and how we would bridge that gap. And we also looked at the um, Digital Curation Center and Data Management Checklist and uh, data management systems, looking at all of those sorts of tools to try and figure out how we can get more secure um, data and have more secure data. And, um, but this is by no means a comprehensive list of, what we, of, of, of the tools that are available now. I mean, this work we did a few years ago now, so there are a lot more, there's a lot more out there. So these are the tools that we um, created, and Claire's gonna go into more detail about them, so I'm not gonna go discuss them, but the, the key thing was that they were, um, is that we wanted to have tools that were reproducible and that um, allowed the, um, and, and that would uh, aid in the data management of projects, not simply be a burden on, um, on our teams. And um, so we, we piloted all those tools and procedures on um, the four different types of projects we have, really, which are excavation projects, heritage science projects, and then those projects where they're using both heritage science and excavation together, and then finally looking at guidance, because we'd identified that um, frequently those were areas where we were needing to re rehash archive as well and finding it difficult. And um, finally, that led us to our implementation, which involved training staff. And the key element here was really getting, making sure that we had that cultural change. So ensuring that they understood what we were doing and how it was going to benefit them. Because um, it's all great and good to say that you must do this. But if people don't believe that it's going to help them and make their lives easier, it's really going to be difficult. And um, so it leads us to the point of do it right and, and, and do it less. And um, that's, that's me done. So. So um, back to the toolkit. So um, working with that principle of uh, data management throughout the life cycle of the project, um, we developed ourselves this toolkit. I'm going to focus on the four areas in purple today, but maybe I should have uh, pointed out that we have a selection and appraisal criteria as well. <laughs> so don't we look great? <laughs> I haven't read it for a while. Never mind. <laughs> and what this means for our data creators is that they, we need them to do more detailed planning and do everyday tasks as part of that project, as, um, such as file naming and uh, saving in a controlled way. And the big addition of, uh, of, to their work is a new way of documenting their work. Um, emphasis on the new, um, the creation of metadata. And so they'll be focusing on those four that have had the most impact. So I do love myself a, a data management plan um, and Drayton Manor Park as well. <laughs> and, um, and so um, I can take absolutely no credit for our, well, we, neither of us can take any um, credit for our, uh, our uh, data management um, plan because it is looks remarkably the same as the DCC checklist and you can find it uh, there. Um, so we create a, a data management plan alongside the project design and then again we review it at uh, UPD stage 
And um, so why do I love them? Well, they're giving us an opportunity to be really specific about the data we're going to produce and obviously plan for it. And um, what we, we have that missing from project designs, that they give those generic overarching statements on what you're going to do with your archive. And parts of those archives might have different requirements. And so going through this uh, at, uh, level, we've picked up and had wins on if there's been um, things such like a gap in who's creating data and um, who's going to put it into our uh, uh, central recording system, a skills gap, uh, contradictory statements buried in the uh, PD, such as this, has, this data has long-term value but isn't going to be archived. And my favourite, making identifying data that is out of scope for us to archive, now known as data creep. And for me as the archivist, it's doing um, one big thing for me, which is creating a definitive list of what I need to archive at the project's, uh, end of a project stage. So don't worry about the fact you can't read it. I just wanted you to see it so you didn't, he wasn't some kind of mythological creature I was talking about. Um, the most important thing just at the moment is just to, point at, uh, to notice that there's headings. And those headings are um, those. And we're finding that we, it's crucial for us to focus, um, or the areas to focus on, are those ones again in purple. And that's because the other areas are sort of covered by general corporate policy and general office procedures. And so as we're finding there's resistance to any additional tasks, um, uh, we have made it so that the just like the DCC, the guy, uh, that template includes guidance, but we also have standardised text for our project managers to build upon. And uh, you'll see that trying to make this, uh, uh, all these tasks as easy and as efficient as possible is a theme that runs through all our tools. So there's the folder structure, exists in that format, and then I did actually sit there and create all them um, all in folders, times two. <laughs> um, and... Uh, before we had a, uh, like he said, before we had adapt, we had it in a mix of project stages and data types. And now what we've done is put further emphasis on project stages and aligned it to MORPH, the HE project management guidance. And that you see all the terminology in that, that first line there. And what that has done, it, the, uh, that standardization is bring for, brings familiarity, less duplication of files, and in increased spa, uh, speed in which uh, users can find files. But what, for me, as the archivist, what it's doing is isolating the data by stage and making sure that I can archive in bite-sized chunks and that I'm confident that that, state, that archive, or those documents are finished and then it can, come out, uh, it can be recorded into the archive. Or what we are going to send to an archive, I suppose. <laughs> Um, we have a file naming convention, it has six parts um, that's specific to what we want but generally the, the three areas you uh, potentially would need to focus on is having an identifier that le uh, links the file to the project, explains the function of the co uh, and the contents of the file and explains the status. This is what it looks like and once you get your head or your eyes around the uh, camel case um, you can see, hopefully, in this quick glimpse, that there's a much more explanation of what is in those files. It's much, it's much clearer. And um, we sold this to our users on that do it right, do it less um, philosophy. If everything, if, if, you, if you, uh, you're doing file naming, unless everything you've got is called book one, and then you're just doing folder naming. <laughs> So, as I'm always telling my kids, put your shoes away. So, I spend so much, you spend so much effort just kicking them around the hall and tripping over them and me shouting at you and listening to me shout at you. Put your shoes away and then you can find them in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, one, uh, a la the last thing is uh, uh, to focus on today is um, the metadata library. So obviously we have a spot where we hold all our metadata forms, look remarkably like the HEA's ones and the ADS's ones. Um, but we also create a metadata library. And this is sort of to try and take out that, that fear and, and um, of what metadata is and also to make this task far more efficient. So we recognise that most of the data we're creating is, um, this, is the same over and over again. So data management plans can be, uh, that we've created and metadata templates 
play, uh, metadata that we created can be used as templates. And so we have um, a spot where we uh, save them, and uh, therefore they can just be um, re uh, yeah, reused over and over again. And this one I created, and just to show you that, go back to that, metadata isn't a scary thing. It's, it is basically, this is the... 1977 documentation of the CE recording manual turned into an ADS metadata template and um, uh, oh I've lost a thread sorry and so it's basically the same data over and over again I've used that at least 50 times I've created that file 50 times to go with each of the projects that have used that recording system because I've been doing a, a backlog archiving and so adapt or perish. Um, although the tasks involved in digital archiving are no different to physical archiving, we create, as we create more and more data, we've identified we need to do this more and more during the life cycle of the project. And with adapt, we set out to provide our data creators with tools of better planning, file management, m um, metadata creation, and hopefully make those tools habitual, um, so those tasks habitual. And you can see also, there's another point to point out, is that those tasks are really, those tools are really cheap and low tech. Um, we identified that the tasks are repetitive and tried to make this as easy, um, to try to use this to make the new tasks for data creators as efficient and, as possible and less scary, or less scary than dragging a, a six by four shed up Silbury. 